So uh, I'm going to say that this is a man who needs no introduction, and it's, it's absolutely true. But I do want to sort of introduce the idea and the occasion just a little bit, because I've been introducing Ted um, for many, many years uh, uh, for readings. And, um, and that's what we're going to start with today. But something that we did, at least for the first time in my experience um, last summer, was with um, a teacher's institute. Uh, the Common Ground Teachers Institute, and we read one of Ted's stories as part of um, a thematic week, an intensive week, in which we're reading stories about loss and recovery. And Ted's got one of those. He's got just about one for any important human experience. So we read it. And then we always discuss those. That's the nature of the Institute. And I asked him, the author is, is nearby, would you like to have him come? Well, they thought that would be a great idea, and he did. And we discussed that story for three hours. We're not gonna do that today. <laughs> We're not gonna do that today. Uh, it's a more, um, a more casual and informal. We are gonna have a bite to eat after the reading, and then we will retire into the Estes Library to discuss the story, and um, uh, the person who will be leading the discussion is my colleague, Professor, Pro Professor Dustin Gish, so uh, we'll look forward to that. But that's what we've never done before. I'm guessing nobody here has done that except for, well, me and Ted, and I know Dustin and Ted have had occasions to discuss his stories. But this seemed like um, the next step, and um, actually went by, had some reason to go by and talk to Jane Sizzik about something else. And I said, she said, what's new? And I said, oh, we have this idea. And we talk, kind of talked it through. And we thought a format like this would be good. So uh, my appreciation to Jane also for helping to translate this idea of, the, of it from a teacher's institute to something that um, is more informal and more familial. So without further ado, I'll ask Ted to come up, um, introduce his story, and read it. Bill. Uh, I have to blame Bill for lots of things, uh, one of which is for my uh, shaping these stories and uh, reading them. Uh, he's been the impresario uh, when, uh, for this, uh, from my impresario, I, and I, I, I'm not, I wasn't a proper writer, uh, so I didn't hire a publicist or anything like that. I didn't even know if things existed. We, we have a couple proper writers here. Wendy Paris is one of our graduates. She's up in New York, and she, she's always thinking about her next book. And, of course, Sybil uh, sent a book, uh, uh, a book off to the pub publisher two weeks ago, and then I had bad news when I arrived at home. I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday of this week, and she said, well... Uh, I, I've got my the idea for my next next book. Oh no, not another <laughs> one. And uh, I said, "Well, that's seven or eight, isn't it?" Yeah, yeah. And that's what writers do. But I'm not that kind of writer. I just had a spurt, you know. It just happened for a little while, those summers. And so I, I wrote. And then Bill said, "Well, why don't you read one of those things?" And and so I read one, and it, it turned out to be a, a nice occasion. I'm talking to women about my. Civil to me having a <laughs> having a baby, <laughs> and boy did they laugh. <laughs> anyway, uh, you need water. I have some water. My my voice is cr cranky. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, um, I should be telling stories about you. Oh, I, I look around here, and there's uh, Davy Bell back there. He and I conspired on so many things, and he was one of the first persons I met at U of H, and Martin Kaminsky, one of our graduates, he, he, uh, he was in our first human situation class, and then uh, Jane, of course, I proudly have the Jane Moore and Sizzik chair, and uh, Jane, uh, your Sizzik scholars and Sizzik uh, programs all over the college, and, uh, and then uh, she has uh, just been a wonderful friend and is a wonderful friend, and Jody Kosicki, the secret, secret, if you don't know Jody, you need to know her. 
Bill and I haven't really admitted this publicly, but for about, I don't know, six or eight years, uh, Bill and I <laughs> sat back in the, the, his, my, my office and we, we talked about uh, Flannery O'Connor and Walker Percy, and then we'd go to lunch. <laughs> 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 and, and Jody ran the honest college. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good arrangement. I, I highly recommend it. And Jody says she's learned something from my, my uh, managerial style in, in her highly <laughs> responsible job <laughs> at the Terry Foundation. She's just looking for the right uh, Jody. <laughs> Listen, I, some of you already been sitting uh, for uh, 20 minutes. Why don't you stand up and, like Bill said, turn your chair. Lisa? Uh, at least is one of our graduates. Turn your chair this way, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, <laughs> stretch your leg one more time. I won't, because I'm going, I decided to read the entire story, and uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, I want you to, to get tired. If you need to take a break, the restrooms are down the hall. <laughs> And if you if you need to take a nap, I always tell my students, if you need to take a nap, just go ahead and take a nap, and then you'll feel better for the rest of the class. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm going to read a story called My Life is a Laputin. Um, now, it's the first story uh, in this uh, collection called Fishing Spirit Lake. We'll have a thought, but I want to say one thing in one sentence about it is that I didn't know this at the time when I was putting this this story together, and then when I was putting the collection that reported how you order stories in a collection, I didn't know that the entire book is in this story. The whole thing is right here in this story. And uh, yeah, I later I realized that after a couple of years, I was like, damn, I didn't have to write, write those other stories, just write <laughs> Why did I waste so much time? Anyway, it's called My Life is a Laputin. Uh, soon after 9 p.m., I climbed aboard a Continental Trailway bus and stared through green gra glass as my parents watched the second of their two sons head off to college. Leaving the station, the bus moved into the bayous of South Louisiana along old Highway 90, then over the swamps and across rice and sugarcane fields, and on through a night of small towns, climbing finally the Sabine River Bridge into Texas, where a mileage marker announced New Mexico, 878 miles. <laughs> That should give any young man enough room, I thought. The bus stopped at 5 a.m. at a larger trailway station where I was to get the 7 o'clock to wake up. After a modest breakfast, I examined the rack of paperback books, thinking this the proper thing for an aspiring young scholar to do. I overcame my shyness to make two purchases. Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, and another August volume, author unknown, entitled Sex and the Adolescent. <laughs> Bought for 50 cents each in the Trailways bus station in Houston, Texas, the two new books double the size of the library I was taking to college. Stored, stowed in the, the trunk of the belly of the bus was a Webster's Dictionary. In a black plastic folder at my side was a King James Bible, red letter edition, a leather bound high school graduation gift with my name embossed in gold on the flexible cover. Uh, now there were not many books in my house in Tylertown, Mississippi. My parents prized education but didn't buy books. But I was soon to learn that uh, I had somehow managed to read about as many books as most of my Baylor University classmates had, which in the fall of 1960 was not too many. Settled back into the trailway seat, 
I glanced first at Carnegie, who I quickly concluded had nothing whatsoever to teach me about winning friends and influencing people. Whatever deficiencies I was carrying to the halls of academe, I was not lacking the capacity requisite to endearing myself to others. All you have to do is say hello and ask a question or two, and people will take you to be a lodestone of generosity and goodwill. <laughs> Sit me down on a stranger on a bus bound for any place, and in no time, I'll win a friend and influence the people. <laughs> Sex is another matter. <laughs> so it was from a state of some wonder that I expectantly turned the pages of sex in the adolescence as the trailway moved through Waller and Hempstead deep into the heart of Texas. Curious woman in the seat opposite leaned over to see what I was reading. <laughs> but I shielded the book from her. It was my first day in Texas and I didn't want to ruin my reputation. <laughs> When I stepped out of the yellow cab and stood for the first time in front of Coconut Hall on the campus of Baylor University, I could not foresee that four years hence, I would drive away from that place alone in my first car, a 58 black custom Ford with overdrive, and there there would be on the seats and in the trunk, surrounded in the spare tire and in the glove compartment, stuffed in every crevice, hundreds of them. Books, books, books on every subject, but especially novels and plays, poetry, theology, philosophy, history, comparative literature. Neither could I foresee that four years hence, I would read nigh of all William Faulkner and would have spent days with King Lear and would have found that I could not understand philosophers named Dun Scotus and William of Ockham and would have been kept alive by a theologian named Paul Tillich and a storyteller named Eudora Wealthy and that I would have taken a liking to Asian stuff, would have even fancied myself becoming a Zen Buddhist and meditating 14 hours a day. When I drove out of Texas in the summer of 1964, I could not then foresee that four years later, in 1968, I would drive away again, this time from Louisville, Kentucky, and this time with a beautiful young wife named Sybil, who by then would have taught me considerably more than I could ever have hoped to learn from that slender volume I purchased in 1960 in the railway station in Houston, Texas, and it wasn't about winning friends and influencing people either. <laughs> but when we drove away from Kentucky in 1968, our new baby blue Chevy Nova couldn't hold them all. I had to call up Mayflower. It was with some pride that I responded to the fellow who was loading the dozens of boxes onto that moving van when he said to me, son, you got more books than any man I ever seen. What you do with all these books? I read them, sir. Son, don't mess with me. <laughs> Ain't no man gonna read that many books. And as if to give me fair warning, he added, you better not. <laughs> Arriving at Syracuse University, I wasn't sure why my teacher in Kentucky had told me go, to go north to study. Maybe he thought it would be good for me to meet people who were not like me, to encounter, as we say now in the university, difference, or to meet people who didn't know as much as I know about winning friends and influencing people. To tell you the truth, during those first days in Syracuse, I tried to erase the differences between me and the people whom I was meeting. I tried to disguise where I was from. I fiercely smoked my pipe and tried to talk right, a feckless project that I had begun back in Kentucky. I had bought my first pipe from a store on 4th Street in Louisville. My philosophy teacher there, an Englishman named Eric Rust, had studied at Oxford and then read everything I wanted to read, and he smoked a pipe. 
He also talked right. One day I went out to his house to discuss my paper on Pillock. Surrounded by books in several languages and sitting in a room filled with the incense of sweet tobacco, he was just the kind of man I wanted to be. All I needed to do was to buy a pipe, read lots of books, and change the way I talked. That seemed easy enough to do. So I took that pipe and set out under the grand maple tree that shaded Sybil's in my balcony at our apartment in a great old house on South Peterson Street. And there I sat, day after day, month after month, reading books and smoking my pipe. Now one thing about the pipe, which is very nice, is that you can spend the best part of an afternoon just trying to light the thing. After a year or two, I got pretty good at smoking the pipe. And I read a lot more books, but I still didn't talk right. I tried to remember to add G to <laughs> words like talking, fixing, reading. So instead of saying I was talking to my teacher and I told him I was fixing to do some reading this summer, I tried real hard to say I was talking to my teacher and I told him I was fixing to do some <laughs> reading this summer. <laughs> Now, talking right is one of the hardest things I ever tried to do in my life. But living in Syracuse, New York was a benefit in that regard because everybody in Syracuse talked right, except Sybil and me, and we were trying to. After a few weeks there, I stopped saying thing in Friday and started saying thing in Friday. It's amazing, just amazing how much better you feel when you talk right. I was doing pretty well until one night in Atlanta, Georgia. I was there for a conference and happened to meet a linguist who taught at the University of Hawaii. We were visiting at a reception after a lecture by Tom Altsheimer. Now Tom was one of those death of God theologians popular at the time. And back then I thought it worth the trouble to travel all the way from Syracuse, New York to Atlanta, Georgia to spend a couple of days talking about the subject. That Hawaiian linguist and I got to talking, and I thought I was sounding pretty good when she stopped right in the middle of the conversation and asked, where are you from? <laughs> well, originally, I'm from Mississippi. I, I always back then said originally from Mississippi to show that I had been moving up in the world. <laughs> But I quickly added I've lived four years in Texas, four in Kentucky, and a couple in Syracuse, New York, speaking more clearly the further north I got. <laughs> well, you really have messed up the way you talk. <laughs> you speak a, with a little of this accent and a little of that accent, it's very unpleasant. <laughs> I think you should talk like people talk in Mississippi. It's a beautiful way to talk. I didn't hear anything else she said the rest of the night. <laughs> Here I had bought a pipe and was getting along towards talking right. And this little woman from Hawaii was suggesting I was on the, the wrong track. She probably wouldn't have liked my pipe either, but I didn't tell her about that. Perhaps then I needed to go north not to encounter something different, but in order to see myself as different and to see the place I had come from as different, maybe special. Getting away from my own place, perhaps I would be able to see it as the place it is, myself as well. But frankly, I went to Syracuse, New York, trying hard to become something else. Whatever I was was not enough. Perhaps it was not even good. I didn't talk right, and everybody on TV in the late 1960s seemed to think that my kind of folks lynched black folks and were ignorant. They didn't associate me with William Faulkner, Eudora Welty, or even Willie Morris, but with Ross Barnett, George Wallace, and Bull Connor. Do you know any people who kill the Negroes? That's what a woman asked me one day at a gift shop in Casanova. I was browsing and she was making small talk with the stranger. She first asked where my accent came from. I admitted that originally I'm from Mississippi. She asked her next question just to make conversation. 
It just popped into her mind. No insult intended. Do you know any people who kill Negroes? I felt accused and guilty and didn't know what to say. I said, not more than two or three hundred. <laughs> and I walked out feeling worse for having gone to Casanova on a beautiful spring day. But it's often the case you really don't know why you go to a place until you've been there for a while. You go for one reason only later to discover the real reason. The real reason, at least one of the real reasons, I went to Syracuse, New York, was to become a Mississippian. In the deep north, there was nothing else for me to be. I discovered that I couldn't be anything else. Some days that I didn't want to be anything else. All this reminds me of the trips that Sybil and I made to Mississippi from Syracuse. Whenever we got back to Syracuse after a couple of weeks in Mississippi, folks would invite us over for dinner. I thought this was mighty nice until I realized that our host not wanted, did not want so much to see Sybil and me, but to hear us talk about Mississippi. They wanted to see us because we had been to Mississippi and had returned which at the time seemed unlikely for a lot of folks living in Syracuse, New York. To them, Mississippi wasn't Pluto, but it was close. Take our friends Tom and Ellen Evans. As soon as we got back from a few weeks in the South, they always would have Sybil and me to dinner. Tom would put on a fine meal, and for two or three hours, Sybil and I told Mississippi stories. Tom and Ellen listened as though we had just arrived from outer space. <laughs> Tom, I said one night, trotting out my best Mississippi drawl. Sybil and I was coming up from Poplarville the other day, and we decided to stay off the interstate and come up on Old Highway 11. Is that the same highway that comes to Syracuse? Tom asked, trying himself to talk with a proper <laughs> southern accent. He should know that a man from Wisconsin can't talk right. <laughs> The very one, I said, Highway 11 starts in New Orleans and goes right through Poplarville, not 100 yards from the house Sybil grew up in. You know the name Poplarville after a fellow named Poplar Jim Smith. Well, anyway, we was moseling along on Highway 11 and got above uh, Nashville, Tennessee, <coughs> headed toward Bristol and Kingsport and was getting along towards dark and we was getting worried about finding a place to stay at. So I stopped at this rundown ga garage to ask if there was any places to stay at up on towards Bristol. Howdy, I said to the mechanic in the garage. I'm a driving north on Highway 11. Can I get a place to stay at up on up the road? <laughs> Why, man, the mechanic replied, that air road runs direct to New York City. You can get a place to stay at wherever you want to on that air road. <laughs> at that, Tom and Ellen fell out laughing. Now you tell me, why would my friend Tom Evans and his wife Ellen, he from Wisconsin, a philosopher and a psychoanalyst trained in Europe, and she an accomplished Montessori teacher from Rhode Island, and I split their sides laughing when I told them that story. It's not all that funny. <laughs> Tom got up to get something else from the table, repeating the very words to himself as he went, said, went to the kitchen. Why, man, that air road runs direct to New York City. He went on laughing just to hear the words. That air road runs direct to New York City. What I didn't tell that man in Tennessee is that Highway 11 doesn't run direct to New York City. It stays west and eventually goes, as Tom had wondered, right into the heart of Syracuse, New York, which is why I was driving on it in the first place. Perhaps the real reason I went to Syracuse was to meet Tom and Ellen Evans, whom Sybil and I love and visit in Newport until this day. They're children and grandchildren too. Now, obviously, I couldn't have known all of that before I went. Meeting them did not make me something else, but it did change me. In retrospect, I see that it made me more truly what I am. I started paying more attention to my place and my people. Sybil did too. For me, it was going north towards home. All this reminds me of a of an Hasidic story. Rebbe Zusia once said, 
When I die, the celestial judge will not ask why I was not Abraham or Isaac or Jacob. The celestial judge will ask why I was not Zeusia. Of course, I didn't go to Syracuse to New York with all that in mind. I went to do serious research in literature and religion. To tell the truth, being serious was more important than religion and literature. They were only the vehicles by which I exercised which was most important, my seriousness. Now, perhaps that is why Steve Lankford and I became good friends. Like me, Lankford had a terminal case of seriousness. He looked like a refugee from a Bergman movie or a Beckett play, gaunt and somber, dark and isolated. He was a man floating alone on an iceberg in the middle of the North Sea. Repeatedly, he narrowed his eyes, which were hardly visible beneath his black, bushy eyebrows. He was a philosopher on leave from the Schwarzwald, the Black Forest. And he was overdosing on Martin Heidegger's being in time, sein und Zeit. Later, my friend interrupted his graduate study and took his new wife, a Sabra from Israel, and a bundle of Miss Middle Eastern passion, if there ever was one, up to a mountain shack in Vermont and stashed himself away to read nothing but Martin Heidegger. <laughs> Zorga, concern, care. That was one of Heidegger's big words. Langford was full of Zorga, serious Zorga, ultimate Zorga as Paul Tillich would have it. So was I. <laughs> Full of it, I mean. It was hard to tell which of us was the fuller. Langford's German was better than mine, but I was as full of Zorga. Back then, I had the idea that in order to stay, say much of anything about a thinker, I needed to read everything that he or she had written. That's not a bad plan for an ego younger scholar, I suppose, but such a plan ill fits a man for ordinary life. You don't have time to take out the garbage or be a decent husband or vote if you set about to read, as I did, all of Paul Tillich, Martin Heidegger, Samuel Beckett, William Faulkner, Emily Dickinson, uh, Wallace Stevens, and many other lights, including W.H. Auden, Harold Pinter, Jean Genet, Albert Camus, wow. Eugene Ionesco, Eugene O'Neill, John Updike, James Baldwin, Joseph Heller, Tennessee Williams, Ralph Ellison, uh, William Styron, Philip Wheelwright, Suzanne Langer, Hannah Arendt, Norman O'Brien, Herman Bacuza with Nietzsche, Freud, and Marx thrown in for good measure, and that is not to mention the Bible, Luther, Augustine, Augustine Slymarker, and the best of all, Miss Eudora Buckley. Now, what surprises me is not that I was captive to such a program of study, but that I was so successful, if that is the word, in following it, but I couldn't keep it up. Looking back, I see I made a fundamental mistake with regard to books. For one thing, I read too many. In that, I wasn't much different from most eager young scholars who get hooked on books. Even Voltaire said he read too many books. Nietzsche said the same thing. Now, I'm all for reading. I spend the best part of my waking hours cajoling students to read books, and I still read a fair number of myself, but too many books can pretty near ruin a man or a woman for that matter. Now, some people suggest that women are somehow inoculated against the mischief that reading too many books can do. They say that women are less inclined to abstraction, more connected with others, and more, they say, relational in their thinking. Reading those books, I'd learn how to turn a page. Now, I don't know all about that. But I do know that too many books can run a good woman as fast as they can run a good man. Women, as well as men, can miss their own lives. Books can take you clean out of the space and time of your own life. 
After 10 or 12 years of doing little more than reading books, you will hardly know where you are and will hardly know the time of day. Take Langford. After two years in a shack on the side of a Vermont mountain with nothing but company except his puzzled wife, a pot-bellied stove, and a stack of books by Martin Heidegger in German, he couldn't find his way around a city block. A few years, years later, he moved to Israel, trying to help his wife recover her sanity. He wrote me that he had recovered or discovered his element. He said his element was the sun. Now that's what locking yourself up in a shack in Vermont and reading Martin Heidegger for two years will do to you. You'll be 35 years old before you notice the sun. <laughs> But reading too many books was only part of the problem. I read books in the wrong way. I thought that reading books is like climbing Ida. Mount Ida is a 12,000 foot peak just north of where Sybil and I spend time, or used to spend time in the summer in, Co in Colorado. When I'm out there, I sometimes think I might climb Mount Ida one day. I could drive about 10 miles up the road, hike up Timber Lake Trail after, after five hours or so, I would be at the summit of Mount Ida. It would be a strenuous walk, but possible. In Syracuse, I thought that reading Paul Tillich or anyone else was like climbing Mount Ida. You get on the trail, you walk up the slope, reach the summit, smoke your pipe, and come back down. Then you move on to another mountain. There are always more peaks in the distance. They are scoops, like scoops of ice cream on an infinitely high cone. But reading Paul Tillich or William Faulkner or Emily Dickinson is not like climbing Mount Ida. Doing x-ray crystallography or working out a computer-aided design or in important ways not like climbing Mount Ida either. Coming to know things that are really important, in this case a great book, is like coming to know a face. There is no summit to a face. You cannot conquer a face. I can never say I am finished and done with Sybil's face. It changes every day. Hence, my knowing of her is always partial, incomplete, provisional. Now, my teacher, Stanley Hopper, following Nietzsche, would call my knowing of her perspectival. Now, up in Syracuse, my teachers, Stanley Hopper and David Miller, tried to teach me this, but it didn't fully take tell the truth, they had done the same thing but when they were eager young scholars. They too had worked and nearly succeeded at reading nigh every book that had been written in about five languages in five fields. Theology, psychology, philosophy, literature, mythology, depth psychology, and the like. When I was studying with them, they added Asian texts to the list. So I smoked my pipe and read the Dhammapada, the Rig Veda, the Tao Te Ching, and the Analects of Confucius. You can add the Bhagavad Gita and parts of the Upanishads as well. My mind was like a garbage can. I was torching everything in as fast as possible. It's a wonder I got out with an ounce of sanity left. Sybil says I didn't. <laughs> I tell you what I was. I was a Laputan. You remember the Laputans? Laputans are those folks who live on the floating island called Laputa in Gulliver's travels. The Laputans are so taken up with speculation that they're like their island home, floating above reality. In fact, they're so engrossed in thought, they forget where they are. If they're not careful, they can fall in a hole or walk right off the island. Uh, Gulliver says that Laputans can neither speak nor hear the speech of others with, quote, without being roused by some external taction upon their organs of speech and hearing. The Laputans need help from a flapper. Now the flapper holds a stick to which is attached a slightly inflated balloon filled with peas or pebbles, 
And when the Laputan falls dangerously deep into thought, the flapper takes the balloon made from the bladder of a sheep and flaps it against the eyes and ears of the Laputan. The flapper brings the Laputan out of thought and back to his senses. For while the Laputan recovers himself in the space and time of his own life. For a few years in Syracuse, New York, I was the Laputan. Sybil was my flapper. Unless she roused my organs of speech and hearing with some external attractions, I was mostly as deaf and dumb as a fence post. Perhaps that was why my teacher in Kentucky told me to go north to study. He knew I needed to learn to pay things, pay attention to things right before my eyes, to learn more fully to inhabit the spaces and times of my own life. One afternoon, I went out to Professor Hopper's house for a little conversation about Martin Heidegger. It was an oral exam. I was not up to or down to Heidegger, but I had slept up the mountain and was ready to expand, expound on his concepts of Dasein, Geschichte, Gegenwartigen, Existential, Existential. Hopper favored the later Heidegger, so I was ready to talk about poetry and the poet's special capacity to step into the clearing of being and to make present what Heidegger calls the fourfold. Mortals, the earth, the sun, the God. That which you seek is near and is already coming to meet you. I was ready to quote that line from the German poet Hürlin, if need be. But I didn't know whether he had written it before or after he went mad. <laughs> Professor Hopper met me at the door, dressed as always in a gray suit, white shirt and tie. We were downstairs. And there they were. Everywhere I stared, I stared at them. There they were. Books, books, books. Thousands of books covering the walls from floor to ceiling in three large basement rooms. And that was only part of his library. I stared and wanted to run out the door and go away to a shack in Vermont and smoke my pipe and read some more books before taking that exam. Ted, Dr. Hopper said, would you like a cup of tea before we talk about Heidegger? That would be fine, Dr. Hopper, I said. We got to the kitchen and my genial teacher started opening cabinet doors one after the other. He reminded me of Mr. Magoo looking for his glasses. Now, where does Helen keep the tea? Let me see, Ted. Where would you suppose that Helen keeps the tea? I don't know, Dr. Hopp. Maybe there above the stove, in the, that cabinet there. Ted, you're right. Here's the tea. Now, Ted, Professor Hopper asked, how did you know that Helen keeps the tea above the oven? I don't know, Dr. Hopper. That's, that's where Sybil and I keep the tea at our house, I guess. Well, Ted, where do you think Helen keeps the kettle? <laughs> it's there, Dr. Hopper. <coughs> there, on the stove. The reluctant light of the Syracuse winter came through the living room windows, and we talked about Martin Heidegger and poetry and about the death and the rebirth of the gods. It is the time of the god that is no more and the not yet of the gods that are to come, I said, quoting Heidegger, who was writing of Hirtevin. I think so, Ted, Professor Hopper said. 
It's like what Wallace Stevens said. We live in a new dispensation of the sun. But to step into that dispensation, dispensation, he said, we must first step back and then down. Then we must step barefoot into reality. That reminds me, Professor Hopper added, of a story that Deshatani Sensei told me when I saw him in Kyoto. You know the story, the student goes to the master and asks, how can I be enlightened? The master offers him a cup of tea and starts to pour, and the student impatiently asks again, master, how can I be enlightened? And all the time the master keeps pouring tea. The tea starts to run out the cup. It runs all over the tatami mat. Finally, the student interrupts and says, Master, the tea is overflowing the cup. And the master replies, You must first empty the cup for it to be filled. There's Helen, Professor Hopper exclaimed. Helen, Helen, Ted, come here, Helen, and say hello to Ted. It was good to see Helen, Helen, this former church organist, now displaying the first signs of Parkinson's. Helen, Dr. Hopper said, Ted had to help me find the tea. I couldn't lay my hands on the tea, Helen. I'm not surprised, Stanley, Helen replied. I'm not surprised. <laughs> Professor Hopper said I did okay on the exam, but I doubted it. I wasn't sure anything I was seeking was coming near. When I got back to our apartment that afternoon, I sat down with my pipe and my well-worn copy of Being and Time to check some things that had come up in the exam. Somehow my effort to be in time seemed all but futile. The dark sky of the afternoon in Syracuse invaded the room, so I put Heidegger and my pipe aside and wandered into the kitchen. It was a clean, well-lighted room. I poured some of the dark, redolent Colombian beans into the coffee grinder. I was surprised again to hear how much a noise a, a coffee grinder makes and how good freshly ground coffee smells. I got the water boiling and the kettle whistling and fitted the filter into the carafe and poured steaming water across the coffee. coffee. I watched the ground soak up the water and heard the slink, slink, slink against the glass. I got out our best china. When I heard the car crunch the snow on the driveway, I poured two cups of fine coffee with sugar and cream and napkins on the tray, I went to the living room just as Sybil came in. Here, honey, I thought you might like some coffee after a long day. Ted, that coffee smells delicious. This is the nicest thing that's happened to me all day. Thank you.